<laughs> I've got it. Hello! Wake, welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 13, on Shot First. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Winston, Ontario, Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone chatting in the lobby here on Twitch. It's really encouraging the support we've been getting here. Join us here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of the feedback, both positive and negative. We got almost no feedback on our Gaming in Pubs and Cafe episode. Now, I don't know if that means we really nailed it or no one has actually listened. I'm hoping for the former. Yeah, me too. The only thing I got was a couple comments on social media, basically just saying, don't play Cards Against Humanity in public, to which I just responded, don't bother playing Cards Against Humanity at all. Uh, now, you can check out episode 11, where I talk about Cards Against Humanity and some of the other worst games I've ever played. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also contact us all over social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, G+, MeWe, Diaspora, uh, that other Discord, Slack, we're, if it's out there, we're probably there. I have not set up our MySpace page. I hope to get that done next week. I am getting reports that I am loud, you are quiet. I turned my level up a little bit, so... Okay. We'll keep going because it's being recorded locally, but if you continue to have a problem, let us know, and we'll hit it the next gap between segments. And now... Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So this week, uh, or this past week, actually got to play on Monday. So it seems like cold season has finally started to pass. Now, I didn't have a lot of people over, but it was nice to start off the week actually gaming. Now, here in Canada and most of the U.S., flu shots are available. So get yours and avoid missing out on too much of your gaming in the coming year. True enough. So we started off the night on Monday with uh, Clank in Space. Now, I'd only played this once before, so I was itching to try it again. Now, a lot of people out there on the web and on podcast land and board game geek and so on keep trying to tell me it's better than the original. And I need to figure out what they're seeing that I'm not. Because so far, I kind of mixed feelings on that. We played three player. It was a very tight game. I'm really digging the variable setup. So that is one definite bonus to the original Clank. The fact you have three different boards that are puzzle fit, so you can put them how you want. And you can flip them. And the map we set up with the jigsaw boards this time had very little healing on any of them, which made the game very interesting. So explain Clank in space. I, I know Clank is you're, you're going into a dungeon and you're trying not to wake the, la the dragon with loud clanking noises. What is, yep. what is the, the concept behind Clank in Space? All right. So it's a sci-fi game, and you are rebels trying to break into the spaceship of Lord Eradicus. You have to get to his tr treasure vault. And one of the differences between this one and Clank in Space is that the treasure vault has a force field around it. Between Clank so, and Clank in Space. Yes. Oh. Yes. Sorry. So to get to the artifacts you need to escape, you have to hack two computers. And to make it interesting, you have to do them on two different board sections. So you can't just hit one tile, hit the two closest terminals and leave. You have to hit one board section, then move to a different section of the ship to hack a section there before you can get to the treasure. So this does a few things. Uh, one of them, it makes the game significantly longer. 
The other thing is it does give you more variability. It's not everyone rushing to the 30 or 25 point artifact and trying to get out. So it's neat. It's definitely more gamery. Uh, what I do like is the card combo thing. So this is like Star Realm. So there's the, some of the cards are normal, like just like the ones in Clank, but then there are other ones that are color coded. So there's orange ones, purple ones, and green ones for outlaws, resistance, and science. And what happens is if you play a card that's the same color. So if you have an outlaw card and you play another outlaw card, some special ability will go off between them. So it rewards your deck building being more specialized than the original Clank, which had none of this, where you just bought whatever you wanted, which often meant just buy the most expensive card you can afford. This, there was a lot more options, where the most expensive card's an orange card, and you haven't bought any other orange cards, you may pass on that and go for something else. So the last game, I went heavy resistance, so heavy purple. And I ended up rescuing a ton of prisoners. Now, the prisoners are the equivalent of the gems in Clank. So what that means is these prisoners are all worth a lot of points in my deck if I can escape. So I had a ton of points in my deck, like a ridiculous number, more than enough that I should have been able to win the game. But you have to, well, you don't have to escape the ship. You have to get back to the command center, the bridge. I don't remember the name of it. The first half of the board, the first part of the board. If you do that and die, you get to keep all your points. So you could still technically win. But the real way to win the game is jump in an escape pod, which gives you a bonus 20 points. If I had made it to an escape pod, I would have won. I was one square away when we lost. So close. Well, so close. <laughs> okay, well, that's interesting. So your, your, your thoughts and feelings. I mean, this is a, this is a heavily loved game uh, out there right now. So I do dig it. It's, it's as good as Clank, I would say, but it's long. Like, it's way longer than the original game. We can finish off a game of Clank in an hour. Clank in space is hour and a half minimum so far, even with only three players. Like it might be a bit too long. Now, it could be, like, I played a lot of Clank, so I know the cards, so I can quickly look over at what's available and go, yeah, I want that one, yeah, I want that. Whereas now there's more, wait, what's that one do? Or pass me the cards so I can read them. So that obviously would increase the playing time. But I think it's the fact there's more you have to do. The whole having to hack two ports before going for an artifact means it long. it's longer. You can't just rush in, grab the cheap artifact, and get out. But because it's longer means there's more time to build your deck and more things you can do with your deck. And there's more paths to victory. Like in the other game, you can't really specialize in collecting gems. It's just if they happen to come up, you buy them because they're good points. Whereas this game, I specifically was able to go, you know what, I'm going to build a purple deck and I'm going to try to go for prisoners. All right. So I'm wondering, uh, just sort of again from the way you're describing it, is it something like... Uh... So we'd be getting a, a little bit of that uh, gamer reviews versus uh, you know average people reviews that are skewing it in. I think that's part of it. Um, another part of it too, I think may be the theme. There are an awful lot of dungeon crawl fantasy games out, and there's a lot of gamers who are kind of sick of it. So the fact it's sci-fi may appeal to more people. Um, but I definitely do think that the the gamers, the the I play heavier games, I like things more difficult, are going to like Clank in Space more. So whereas the original Clank, I have no problem bringing out to a game night, whereas Clank in Space, I would probably pause bringing that out. Makes sense. All right. So after... Sorry, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> So after Clank in Space, I uh, broke out St. Petersburg again. So if you've been watching the show, listening to the podcast, following along, you probably notice I tend to play games in spurts. I play a game, I dig it a lot, then I want to play it with a bunch of different groups, and I bring it out to different game nights, and I bring it out on my Monday night, and I bring it out to the, the local game store, and so on. Like, you saw me go through this with Bruce, and then you saw it with Hansa Teutonica. Well, right now, that hot game for me is St. Petersburg. This was my third game with the new edition, uh, second time using the market. And wow, did the market dominate this game. Like it played so different than the last game I played using the market. Like it was a cool new thing, the last game, and it was a neat new phase and some new cards to collect and a new way to score points. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of cool. This game, the market determined the winner. Uh, it was Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton who was playing it and he managed to get the lead in all five market types and he blew away the rest of our scores like like by far it was a race for second so did he outplay you or is there a, a mechanic that just isn't quite working that you 
Hadn't caught See, before? I don't, it's hard to tell. I don't think it's broken. I think this is part of the game and it's meant to be there. And I think the other players need to watch and make sure it doesn't happen. Like, you can't ignore the market yourself, and you can't let someone else monopolize, like, the entire phase of the game, basically. We let Sean, Sean, here you go, you do the market stuff, we'll focus on the other stuff, that doesn't work. So it'll be interesting the next time we play to see if it comes up again, especially now knowing that this can happen, or... It, Maybe it was just a fluke. Maybe it just the order of the cards came up, the player order, because there is some interesting stuff when you play three players where two of the players start first in two of the phases and the other player just starts first in one of the phases. So that may have been it in the order you took those phases in. I don't know. So I, it's, it's one, the, the, the jury's still out. I still really dig the game, though. I, I don't, there is a small chance maybe it's broken, but I haven't heard anyone else complain about it either. It's, it's interesting because... That's exactly the kind of thing that I find Anshi Games normally catches. Someone, yes. will, someone will be on a roll and think they've gotten everything figured out, only to, at the last moment, find that somewhere along the way Anshi Games has sabotaged them and the entire plot comes crashing down around them. <laughs> yeah, understandable. See, and what the problem was this time is she didn't play. So oh, that's probably wow. why it happened. There we go. <laughs> so, right. That, ex that, that explains it. it all then. There, <laughs> there we you go. go. <laughs> yeah yeah she wasn't feeling so great that night so yeah. so the rest of the week um did the usual played board game arena i'm not going to get into details I, you all know what games i've been playing on there but i do want to talk about one specific game and more specifically uh the crossroads expansion for takaido someone i don't know who out of the group of us who are all playing on board game arena started a game probably eric uh with five of us and i got to the first stop and I'm like, whoa, what, what's what's going on? All of a sudden, this thing pops up. And instead of donating to the temple, like, I can buy, like, a talisman. And wow, was I lost. Like, I, I we played quite a bit at Takedo. Takedo is not a hard game. I played it in person many times. And we played many games on Board Game Arena. But throwing that in really threw me for a loop. And have I mentioned that Board Game Arena is not good for learning games? <laughs> See, it was interesting because... I completely thought it was just the character that I'd chosen. That makes I, sense. I thought that there was a feature that I'd forgotten about when I picked the character that when I landed here, I got an extra choice. And until I read the show notes <laughs> that there was a Oh, wow. I had no idea. I was, I was just <laughs> assuming it was my character. Um, oh, that's funny. Didn't have a clue. I'm like, I don't know the game well enough. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> okay, I'll play. Um, that's funny. And yeah, so... I, I didn't realize it continued that long. So I think I've played all the all the characters in the original game. I don't know. So uh, eventually we figured it out. Well, I figured it out. Um, and I dig it. Like, it's neat. It literally doubles. Like, it, it not even doubles. What do you call that when it exponentially doubles by the power of? Like, yeah, it squares it. It, 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 it squares it. That's yeah. the word I was looking at. I couldn't think of the word. It squares the decision space in the game, which is impressive. Oh, yeah. Like every stop, you now have two options and they're both pretty good. Um, the other thing that was cool is it eliminated dead moves. So one of the problems in that game, though, actually, that's part of what makes it cutthroat, is you can land on spots and get nothing out of it. Like if you already have all the vistas and you land on a vista spot, there's no reason to do that. You already have them all. Well, now instead you can take a cherry tree that gives you a buck and two points. So there's a reason to do it. There's uh, ways to get free food and other things. If you don't want to encounter people because you're not playing that person, you can instead um, get calligraphy written. I dig it. I actually, I actually like it quite a bit. Now I'm not going to go on about it anymore because the way, because of the timing of when we do these episodes, I've actually played my physical copy and got it off the pile of shame, but that won't actually come up until next week's week in review. All right. So I guess that well, next time we'll have uh, Meat Space mirroring Cyberspace as yes. uh, the BGA meets the real world. That's true. I One of the things, to, to be honest, one of the reasons I wanted to play it was because Board Game Arena is really not good at teaching you the rules. And I wanted to touch the physical cards and read the actual rules. And I found that actually really helped. So now if I play on Board Game Arena, I actually know what's going on. So the last game of the week was Friday. Like, I mean, I played the game Friday, but it was on Saturday. So I played Friday on Saturday. Does that make sense? It's a game. It's a green box. It's a solo game. 
Uh, it's called Friday. It's from the whole story of um, Robinson Crusoe. And you're playing his man Friday. So anyway, the reason I reviewed Friday is I wrote a blog post about solo games. And that's obviously what we're also talking about tonight. So while writing it, I needed a picture because I'm like, I need a picture for the top of this blog post. I need a featured image. And I just didn't want to use a box of one specific game. I wanted something that had, for one, my bell in it. So I went downstairs and I looked around. I'm like, oh, where's a good solo game? Oh, Friday. So I took out Friday and I set it up and I took a couple pictures. I'm like, I got it set up. I might as well play it. So, it's with all the gamers in your household, and all the gamers regularly dropping by. It has got to be tough to get any solo game time in. <laughs> uh, true enough. Like we'll get into it more when we get to the actual question. I'm definitely no solo game expert. That's not my main way to interact with this hobby. That's not my thing. Uh, but yeah, if I'm playing I, that, and I don't need to play solo because, as you mentioned, I have gamers come over pretty regularly. Like to scratch that board gaming itch, I just gotta wait a couple days. Yes, I'm lucky that way. Or maybe I built a really good community here in Windsor. The the verdict may be out on that. I, I think there was a lot of effort involved there, and, and less than luck. Yeah, well, we'll see. So playing that game of Friday brought back a lot of memories. Like I remember sitting down with this game and it was at some point when Angie games was out of town. I think she was at a conference in Toronto and her mom was kind enough to take the kids. So I sat down and played it until I beat it, which took about 10 tries and which I just remember doing that that weekend. So I got a good nostalgia going on. So then I played this, I flipped a couple cards. And I remembered exactly what to do. I did terrible, but it was still fun. So now, we, in, oh, yeah. So I mean, it's just sometimes it's nice to be able to kick back and have that me time. That's not a book or not a uh, not a consumption experience, but a, but an engaging experience. And while there are always video games, which I, I know we'll we'll briefly touch on, uh, there's yeah. just something focused about you know a real meat space game in front of you. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So Friday itself, the game, uh, it's a deck builder. You're Friday, and Robinson Crusoe gets stranded on your island, and you have to, excuse me, guide him, help him out, because he's useless. It basically starts off with a card deck that represents him, and it's a card full of cards like weak, lazy, distracted. I think his only good card he starts with is one card that says brilliant. And basically, you sit there, and Robinson fumbles around, and you draw cards, and you have to challenge them. Face the challenges, and that lets you draw cards from the one deck, and you try to succeed, and if you succeed, you get to take that challenge card and put it into your deck, and it, it's neat because basically Robinson gets smarter, he gets stronger, he learns things. The other thing that's neat is when you fail, he learns from his mistakes, and you're able to burn cards out of the deck, so you get to get rid of cards like weak, distracted, and lazy. It's very neat. Now, I went into way more detail over on the blog post. So head over to tabletopbellhop.com, and if you click on On the Table, you can read more about Friday. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, do you know when this game was published? Roundabout? Uh, it's been a while. Uh, off the top of my head, no, I'd have to Google it. I'm going to guess like 2005. Because I have to say, I mean, Robinson Crusoe has got some imperialist and racist overtones. I'm not even sure if they're teaching it in school anymore uh, now i mean i see this game has obviously tried to sort of flip that by making yes, friday i was gonna say it, it pretty powerful, much but yes. i mean that, that doesn't take away from the fact that the story itself has got some questionable um in this day and age questionable uh overtones. yeah fair enough i the theme doesn't come out in this like it could have been themed as anything it's basically start off with someone who's useless and through adversity train them to be better so they did a good job on that there's none of the cards or the threats that you're facing that i noticed were inherently problematic but then i admit i was more looking at the mechanics on the cards but i didn't see any like exploit the natives cards for example though it might have been thematic to the game but it seems like they avoided that an interesting note just here's your side note the game is designed by friedman freese who's actually famous for power grid so you take the game people call math the game and he makes this solo thematic card game i thought that was an interesting or surprising twist shows a lot of flexibility in uh, his design shops 
Yes. No, the guy's amazing, actually. You always know his games because they always come in a green box. You always know him at a con because he has green hair. Go. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, and she Games. So most of our chat tonight has been uh, a little more on the technical side. Uh, we've got Steve and uh, Shadzar in there chatting away. Yep. We haven't delved too much into game chat yet, but let's see what, see what happens as we get into the meat of our topic. Yeah, it seems like people are definitely enjoying the new uh, Nightbot chat. Uh, Sean spent some time in the last week working on getting our chat bot working a lot better. So now it's our chat room's a little more interactive. So you can do a few things in there, like find out our website or where to find us on Instagram. Or you can read the Bellhop's Law. You can quote the show. Uh, we can make people favorites. There's a bunch of neat functionality. And if you want to see it, you got to come watch us on Twitch. So come to our lobby next week and you can can play with Nightbot. Absolutely. Our first giveaway is going strong. Yes, it is. Last week, I posted a review of a cool piece of gamer bling called The License to Slay from the Bureau of Dragons. Along with that review is our first giveaway. As of right now, we already have 65 entries, and there are only six days left. If you are listening to the podcast on the day it drops, today is your last day to enter. So head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, read the review, and if you're interested in your own license to slay, enter the contest at the bottom of the review. November 3rd and 4th, myself and a bunch of local Windsor gamers will be gaming for more than 24 hours in support of Extra Life. This is a worldwide charity event generally Driven by video gamers, we take part in the tabletop part. Those of you watching on Twitch are probably well aware of this as Twitch is the major sponsor of Extra Life. Now, this charity event supports the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. The gamers of Windsor have raised $14,000 over the last five years, so no plan on slowing down. To find out more about what we're doing and how you can help us out, head over to www.windsorextralife.com. Uh, uh, that would be a big, what would be a big help to us is spreading the word. When you see Mo sharing information about online, Twitter, Facebook, or G+, like, comment, and share. A suggestion from Shadzar is to add exclamation mark extra life to, as a drop a link to the WindsorExtraLife.com. That, that's actually why I, I forgot that it was supposed to be my, my, my <laughs> me next. Uh, ah, there we go. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content platform. Help us spread our gaming advice to the world. We especially love Apple podcast reviews because a good rating on Apple increases the chances of us showing up in a search. Now, honest, real listener reviews and ratings continue to be the best way for shows to grow, no matter who else is trying to cheat the system or play the number. So take that time, stop by iTunes or Apple Podcast, leave a message and a, and a star rating. Yes, please. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Uh, this includes bod uh, blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and you can find a spot to sidebar. Now, one bonus, NG Games has convinced me that the newsletter is us talking to our biggest fans, and we should reward that. So moving forward, we're going to try to put some content in that newsletter that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, when we start our next contest, we plan to give bonus entries for people who subscribe to the newsletter. Now, last Sunday, I finally found time to do a couple Kickstarter unboxing videos. Since I knew at least three boxes to do, I decided to give it a nice hashtag. So when I was sharing it on social media, and I called it Unboxing Day. And while there were some small issues, we had a little audio problem. The event went rather well, all things considered. Yeah. 
I don't know what it is, but my microphone started making noise. It kind of went backwards. It was inverse universe. Went, Other than that, it did. It seemed to go pretty good. And the, well, the the audio went very bad, and we apologized to anyone who was listening at the time. But we yes. stripped it down. We pulled it down right away. Stripped out the bad audio and got it right back up as soon as Twitch allowed us to, which was the problem. Uh, for some reason, they don't like uploading because it turned out every upload that failed did actually go through because the next morning oh, when God. I logged in, there were five <laughs> copies of it waiting to go live. <sighs> All right. Well, at least it worked. So anyway, so there's these videos. They're out there. You can find them on our Twitch stream. You can find them on YouTube. The first one is the big brass Kickstarter from Roxley Games. Now, I had one big box that said brass on the side. I opened that up, and it had two smaller boxes. I figured I was going to open that up, and there'd be four smaller boxes. I was going to open those, but no. It was only two boxes. There was uh, Brash Lancashire and Brash Bur Bur uh, Brass Birmingham. Playing Brass Birmingham, and it's harder than I thought it would be. Now, I open both these up, and they look amazing, especially when compared to the original printing. Brass is one of the best Martin Wallace games I've ever played, and Martin Wallace makes some good games. Now, they're on the heavier side. These are economic Euro games that are very much about managing your resources, managing money, and engine building, and being able to try to pay back, take out loans at the right time, and pay them back at the right time. Uh, the original game was fantastic, but ugly like one of the ugliest games that has ever been produced i am very happy to have these deluxe versions now as part of the kickstarter i was able to upgrade the money chits that would have been cardboard chits to basically poker chips the, they're calling them iron clays now i thought it was really cool because i thought i was getting one set of iron clays for both games and it ends up there was one in both games so, well, one set of Iron Clays in both games. And they are really, really nice. Like, I plan on keeping a set out just to use when playing other games. Any that, game that uses money. Yeah, no, the uh, the chips were fantastic. Uh, what interested me was the fact that they spent a lot of money on printing. Yes. Some of it unnecessary. Uh, well, so, yeah. I mean, for all I know, they might have, like, you know, they may have scored all sorts of deals. But I, I wonder, you know, about how they're financing and, and doing their money when the shipping ex exterior of the shipping boxes are branded and printed. I mean, it was, it was single color printing. It wasn't outrageous, but you know, they were, they were branding and, and printing on throwaway boxes. Um, it's true. And that was, that was an odd. odd now it, it also might've been brilliant marketing because everyone, myself included, who got that box immediately took a picture of it and shared it on social media and was like, look what showed up. So that might have been actually a good plan. Rising Sun was the first one I saw that did that, but I, they just had stickers. So you had your big generic cool mini or not box and a big sticker on the side that said Rising Sun Kickstarter. I don't know. Oh. I, I did I did think the same thing. Like, I don't need brass. And it was two-sided. Like, it wasn't even just on one side oh, of the yeah, box. They, they, they went all out. And I'm, you know, I'd have to check, but I would guess that the, printing those boxes costs more than just a ton of generic stickers. So. For it, you know what? It might have been a Kickstarter stretch goal. I don't know. I don't remember. I obviously well, I back these on Kickstarter. I'm, I'm bad for Kickstarters. Like I decide I want the game, I back it, and then I don't follow up. I don't keep watching all the updates. I just like, eh, it'll show up eventually. I find otherwise I obsess over it, and I'm checking every day, and I'm reading all the updates, and I'm getting frustrated by people who are getting angry in the comments when they should. Whatever. I just I back. I. I Sometimes take a long time to back. Once I back, I just back off. I'm like, eh, right. it'll show up when it shows up. Hopefully, and, and, it'll show up. And really, that's the best way. I mean, Kickstarter, we, we haven't talked about Kickstarter all that much. We should probably actually no, do a really. Kickstarter episode. Uh, because it is a gamble. It is a it is an interesting way. And I think uh, both of us have varying opinions on how it's used in the industry right now. And, <laughs> yes. And whether or not it's a good thing. Uh, so that, <laughs> that we should probably, you know, uh, put a ding in it and... Uh, you know, do an episode about uh, Kickstarter. So up next was Endeavor Age of Sail. So this is another one that's a reprint of an older game. Now, this wasn't uh, an ugly game. The original Endeavor from Z-Man Games was pretty nice looking. It, it looked pretty good. This is a deluxified version of a classic game from 2009. Uh, this one's from Grand Gamers Guild and Burnt Island Games. And I gotta say, it's possibly even more impressive than Brass. Like, Brass, when compared to its original, blows it away because the original was so ugly. But if you compare the overall 
end result of Endeavor versus Brass, Endeavor may have stepped above. Now, it has all new artwork and a ton of really cool component upgrades, stuff that didn't need to be changed but looks so great when they do, like changing little cubes that track your... There's four things you're tracking, and it's normally tracked with just cubes in your color. Well, instead, they made little 3D things. So your industry is a pile of bricks. Your... Um, I don't even remember the four things and I just played yesterday. Your currency is like a gold coin and so on. It just looks so much cooler than bricks. And then the boards are inset, which I love inset boards. So the opposite of Terraforming Mars where stuff doesn't slide around... This, or sorry, does slide around in Terraforming Mars. This, everything has a place and it slots in really nice, like in Scythe. I really, like, to me, this is what should be in a deluxe game. Yeah, no, if you're going to call something deluxe, live up to it. Make yeah, it, exactly. Make it actually deluxe. And, and from what I saw on the stream, uh, it looked like a, a very well put together game. Yeah, I agree. If you want an example of how not to do a deluxe edition, I'm going to bring up Friedman Freeze again. Check out Power Grid Deluxe versus Power Grid, because Power Grid Deluxe was there's nothing really deluxe about that. So now about Endeavor, I will talk about it more. Again, non-linear podcasting. I have played Endeavor, but technically it's going to be a next week's week in review instead of this week's. And I'll let you guys know if it plays as nice as it looks. Interview. So. So one of the things is you can check out the unboxing videos both on Twitch and soon on YouTube. They're not up on YouTube yet, but they're on Twitch. They'll be up on the YouTube. Watch our social media. We'll do the shout out. Let everyone know when they're live. Again, there's one video that has both boxes of brass and another video with Endeavor. The audio quality on the brass one is mono and kind of crappy because of the problem we had, but at least we were able to recover some of it. So it's there. So now, for those of you watching live, tomorrow, Tuesday, October 25th at 8.30 Eastern, Sean and I will be interviewing Phil Vecchion. He'll be joining us to talk about his new RPG, Hydro Hacker Operatives, better known by fans as H2O. You may remember us talking about H2O and Phil and the rest of the Gem Team during our Queen City Conquest episode. If you missed that one, you should be able to find it in our backload as a special episode. That's correct. Actually, QCC was nice. H2O is a fantastic new hydropunk powered by the Apocalypse RPG. And it's going to be able to, well, it's going to be great to be able to chat with Phil about his game. We invite you to join us for this interview tomorrow. For those listening at home, expect to see a bonus episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Live dropping into your podcatchers. One last thing. If you have any questions for Phil, there's not a lot of time. This is for mainly the people right now in our chat room. Uh, we'd love to pass them on. You can send them to the usual place, mo at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media, or ask them right now in the chat, and Anshi Games will bookmark them for tomorrow's show. So I started something new over on the Tabletop Bellhop blog, tabletopbellhop.com. So every Thursday, I'm going to resurrect some of my old content. Like, over the years, I have put out a number of reviews, game write-ups on Board Game Geek, the old Windsor Gaming Resource Pro Boards Forum, on the WGR blog, on social media. I've written a ton of reviews on Google+. Plus. Uh, actually, Google+, Plus declining, is one of the things that has inspired me to do this. Because a lot of this content is still valid and relevant. And Anshi Games was the one who pushed me to say, why don't you reshare some of that older content under the new Tabletop Bellhop brand? Well, the Windsor Gaming Resource is dead. A lot of that content is still suitable for a wider audience. And we've got that now with the Tabletop Bellhop. That's true. Yeah, one of the problems with the WGR is it was kind of split. Because I would talk about local stuff and local events and local gaming stuff. But then I post a review for something like everyone in the world should read this review. It's a good review. And it's like the local people didn't like the universal content. The universal content were like, I don't want to read that blog. It's too much about local stuff and I don't care what's going on at whatever the CG realm. So I I, we dis I decided to split it. That's why I'm now the tabletop bellhop instead of I, whatever I was for the WGR, local gaming ambassador. So we have, I have started this. I've technically posted two of them. But in this week's re-review, I take a look at a book called Never Unprepared, The Complete Game Master's Guide to Session Prep. Now, this was published by Engine Publishing and is written by one Phil Vecchione. For those of you paying attention, that is the same Phil we are interviewing tomorrow. 
That's correct. Never Unprepared is a 131-page softcover book or PDF. I have the PDF. Uh, talking all about RPG game prep. In it, Phil uses his project management experience to codify game preparation, breaking it down into five steps. Brainstorming, selection, conception, documentation, and review. Now, the book really deep dives each of these steps. You know, I think a lot of players who haven't run games really underestimate the prep required for a solid, smooth-running game in many, if not all, systems. Yeah, there is now there's a lot to like about Never Unprepared. For one, it's not presented as a one true way. It's not this is Phil's way to do game prep and everyone should do it. Instead, it provides a bunch of tools for your game prep toolbox. The other thing I really liked is it's and what I expected when I first read it was that it's going to say more prep is better. You must prep more, prep more often and you won't fail when you start. It's not like that. Instead, it gives you a bunch of great tools for determining just how much prep is too little, and sometimes more importantly, how much prep is too much. Balance. Um, I don't know how many times we talk about balance on this uh, show. It, it applies to everything. Now, the best part about reading Never Unprepared is the way it makes you think about your own techniques and how you can improve them. The way the book leads you to introspection is what I think is most valuable to all GMs. Even those who play games that don't have prep, like most Powered by the Apocalypse games or games like Fiasco, or GMs who play prep-filled games but still prefer lean more on the improv side. You know, even a skilled improviser needs a pool to draw from, uh, to work to work within, and, and that just doesn't come out of the ether. Now, I wrote this review way back in 2012, and I was surprised to see that most of my thoughts from that time period still stand. Now, the most interesting part for me, though, was when I read that book, I didn't know who Phil Vecchione was. That was a name on a page. I was approached by uh, Martin Ralia to read this book because he liked some other review I had written. Now, Phil is someone I listen to twice weekly on podcasts, someone I played games with, someone I've shared a meal with, and someone I would say I consider a friend. It was very cool reading this book as it was kind of a look back into my now friend's past. That we've only scratched the surface of. He goes into a lot more depth over on the blog. Uh, <laughs> head over to tabletop tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. Check the show notes for a direct link. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming game night questions. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Bellhop. We also have a G Plus community. It's got a section to ask questions. I'm on Twitter pretty much all day. You can get a hold of me there. You can head over to our Facebook page. Uh, if you have me personally, Mo Tuzano, as a friend on Facebook, send me a DM. We'll take your questions anywhere and everywhere. We just want you to be able to reach us. Now, today's question, Bill Vecchione over on Misdirected Mark Slack channel asks, do you have any recommendations for solo border card game? Thanks for the question, Phil. Yes, this is the same Phil. Um, this week on Tabletop Bellhop, you get the Vec experience. I kind of somewhat planned, somewhat not all at once. Um, if you're a Patreon black backer, I actually just published a blog post over there kind of explaining how the Vex experience happened. Um, we reviewed one of his old books. We're answering his question. Tomorrow we're doing an interview from him, with him. Sorry. So Phil and his uh, friends, uh, team at Misdirected Mark, are patron supporters at the good tip level. So when Phil asked his question, it got bumped to the top of the list. Yeah, that is correct. Maybe he knew we were interviewing us when he asked the question and planned it out. Phil is a bit of a master manipulator. It may have all been part of his big plan. So it's also a really good question. So despite the fact Phil is a Patreon backer and I bumped it up, this is a good one. This isn't one we covered yet. And when I commented online that, hey, I'm writing a blog post and we're going to be talking about solo games, I got a lot of excited comments. There are a lot of solo gamers out there looking for new games to play. You know, it's, this is something I'm actually interested in, particularly because while I am a gamer, I'm not in a family of gamers the way you are, and I haven't built a gaming community around me. 
Uh, so for me, a gaming experience tends to be rather solo, and as a result, I don't end up uh, doing all that much. Of it. So, first off, I am no expert on solo games. That's really low on my XP level. I am not a big solo tabletop game player. When no one's around and I want to play a game, that's when I boot up my PlayStation 4 or my Xbox 360 or a video game system or I grab my phone and play some Marvel Puzzle Quest. For me, video games are for that time I want to play games by myself. Uh, I, I, I've talked a number of times about Fortnite, uh, XCOM, mm -hmm. uh, and Diablo. Uh, those are really my solo experiences. Uh, for me, and then also, there's also a uh, a wider experience. Games like Minecraft uh, is a family game for me. My whole family down in our house and all play Minecraft uh, together on the same world. Um, but uh, again, yeah, video games really do tend to be a introvert's experience for me as yes. well. Now I do I do play some online multiplayer as well, but it's not the same as it's when I'm home alone. Right, I'm going to play with people multiplayer, but they're wherever, usually way far away. Like Seattle is the one guy, and another guy's in um, uh, that place with the Scottish people. Scotland, the place with the Scottish people. That That's going to get clipped, isn't it? <laughs> okay, then. Yes, I play with a Scotsman. It is hilarious to play with him. What he says while playing Destiny would cause us to bleep out the next section of the show. Anyway, so, yeah, in general, I, I when I want to play a game by myself... I play on a video game system. So I have not played a lot of solo games, but I have played some. And some of the ones I played I find rather good. I, I think they're pretty excellent. Now, as you're probably aware, I consume a silly amount of tabletop gaming media. Like between blog posts, reviews, game forums, and of course podcasts. Like I'm consuming more than 40 hours a week of gaming content easily. I probably do more than 40 hours a week just to podcast. Uh, I read many articles and listened to many shows talking about solo gaming. Now one of the things we try to offer is not just hands-on experience, but a deliberate and knowledgeable analysis mm -hmm. of media. We can't play all the games. Uh, no. <laughs> there just isn't enough time and not enough patrons to uh, support that <laughs> kind of existence. Uh, but because just because the bellhop hasn't played something uh, doesn't mean that with years of experience behind him uh, and uh, a tremendous pool of resources and knowledge and friends to work with in the, the, bell, the board gaming arena that he can't look at the reviews media that's out there and pull out the substance of a game without having to uh, just pander to the PR that gets vomited up by uh, a company. Fair enough. I think I'm blushing a bit. <laughs> uh, so the following list that I'm going to go through is going to be a mix of games I personally played and ones I've tried and the rest of it's going to be games that came with strong recommendations from more than one source. Like there wasn't a game that showed up on one list. I'm not going to mention that one. It's multiple places. Multiple people are claiming these are very good games to play by yourself. Now, as always, we respect and we want our listener opinions. If you have a strong mm -hmm. feeling about these or other games that we may have missed, don't be afraid to let us know. Yes, please do. So the first game I'm going to mention is Onirim, O-N-I-R-I-M, Onirim. It's rather well known. Uh, it's every, pretty much every top list has it. This one I own. Uh, you can play it two player, but it's designed to play one player. It's got a really funky, cool theme where you're having a dream and you're trying to open doors in this evil scary demon things getting in the way. It's very cool. You're doing a lot of hand management, card management, playing different cards with really cool art. It is a solo game I own and I do enjoy and will play now and then. You know, I love art style on this, yes. uh, on this game. I, you know, looking, looking at it, it is amazing. It's, I mean, collectors, collectors piece just for the art. I would, I would sleeve this yep. game in a heartbeat. <laughs> I would not want her, and I don't sleeve games. I mean, I never sleeved a magic card in my life. Uh, I would sleeve this game in a heartbeat. It's just beautiful. Yeah, understandable. That is really cool. So what a lot of people don't seem to know is that Onirim is only one game in a series called the Oniverse. 
Now, all of these, as Sean will probably appreciate, all have the same artist, so they have a very distinctive style that spreads over them. The other three games are Sylveon, Castellion, and Nautilion. Now, I have no experience with any of those, but based on the research I did, Nautilion came up on the most different lists as the best single-player game. No Onarim tended to outrank it. So start with Onarim. If you like Onarim, check out Nautilion is what it seems like. So one thing I will note is at least Onarim is available as an app. So I will admit that I guess I'm kind of jumping back to video games because I did sell my physical copy and I just have it on my phone now and I will play it on my phone. Uh, you mentioned Nautilion. Uh, I... Not sure if that's in publication anymore because it's listing on Amazon at 150 bucks. So <laughs> yeah. So Unreal uh, this Castilian, is something that comes up on the show a lot. Anytime I'm recommending games, there's probably a pretty good chance they're out of print. I am cult of the new in the fact that I like to try new games, but I am not cult of the new that I have to play the new hotness that came out at Origins Gen Con or Essen, which is starting tonight. I don't care that it's new brand new have to try it i dig old games as much as i dig new games and i just like trying new stuff so a lot of my recommendations may be for older sadly out of print games and hopefully we'll all be lucky in tom vassal's law which has to do with the fact that any game if good enough will get reprinted eventually does come true as happened with endeavor and brass birmingham and lancashire yeah so it looks like you can get a hold of honorim uh the first and second edition uh as well as castilian at a reasonable price it just Nautilion that uh, has huh. gone crazy, it looks like. Maybe it, maybe it's between print things. I hope so. Again, I can't strongly recommend it myself because I haven't tried it, but it does seem very popular. Yeah. So one thing I've noticed looking at these games is there seem to be certain themes that are popular for solo play for some reason that, that tend to stick out. And one of them being survival. And my favorite solo game that I personally played is Friday. Now, I talked about this back in the weekly look back, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's a solo game where you're trying to help Robinson Crusoe escape the island after becoming stranded. Uh, now, this one has an iOS app, too. Have you tried the, uh, the app of No, version? I have not. Uh, no, that one I still have my physical copy, so I haven't, I haven't tried the app. Uh, and Friday comes up with some, some big uh, guns supporting it. Uh, Spiel oh, yeah. is recommended, Golden Geek nominee, Golden Geek Best Card Game nominee, Fair Play a la carte winner. Um, it's, yeah. You know, there's a lot supporting this game, uh, the Friday game. Put it this way, I don't, as I mentioned, I don't tend to play solo games, but I bought Friday based on all those accolades. And it's deserved. I really dig it. So if you dig Friday, or at least the theme of Friday, ignoring the whole colonialism thing that came up earlier, uh, you can check out a bigger version called Robinson Crusoe Adventures of the Cursed Island. Now, this is a co-op multiplayer game normally, but it can be played solo. It's the exact same theme, but it's a big box game. It's not like a quick filler. You're not going to finish in 15 minutes. It's considered one of the best co-op games, period. And many people are saying it's just as good solo. Now, it's very neat and does some really cool stuff with cards. So it's a card-based game where you're going to draw a card and you're going to go through it and you may have to do some tests and stuff and something's going to happen with that card. And then often the cards get fed back into the deck. So, for example, you could draw a card where you're ch chosen, you can go explore somewhere. You succeed at, ex or you fail at exploring. Well, you get to go to the area, you're bit by a spider. Well, then you have to take the spider card and put it back into the deck. And at some point, that spider card's going to come back up and, like, someone will die of poison. Like, it's very neatly done with the card-based mechanics. I've been told by many people that this is just as good co-op as it is multiplayer. So, and, and fair warning, it is a heavy game. It's rated at a 3.74. Yeah. Um, so yes. This is, this is not for your light-friendly, uh, you know, family games necessarily. But it is no, available. No, this is... Yeah, that's, that's out there. Now, the designer, Ignacy Trevzhashek, did put out a retheme of it on Mars. The reviews on that are so bad, I've refused to buy it at $16. Now, from what I understand, it's all rulebook problems, and those have been fixed. But he botched the launch so badly that I can't recommend this one. But if you dig Robinson Crusoe, the big version, not, not Friday, but Robinson Crusoe, you may want to look at First Martians. Uh, well, and First Martians comes up as even heavier. 
So yeah, well, <laughs> by a lot. Well, from what I understand, the rules in the box you can't play. It's like some of those games on my worst games of all time list from episode eleven. Right. So they there is a fix online supposedly, but whatever. An interesting first Martian is recommended as a one player best. Yeah, see that I assume so because it's a retheme of this game. So another game that I couldn't help but hear about is Seventh Continent. Like uh, for a while there, I swore the internet couldn't shut up about Seventh Continent. Now it's root. But before Root, it was Seventh Continent. This was a Kickstarter exclusive. So you're not going to find this one on Amazon. Or if you do, it's probably three, dollars $400. You're not going to find it at your local game store unless they backed at a retailer level. Um, this is one I'm starting to regret not buying based on the amount of feedback I'm getting. This is a card-based exploration game. Again, you're not on an island. You're on a lost continent. Same idea, right? And you're trying to survive. I guess the theme is that you had visited the island once before and took some treasures, so you're cursed, and you have to rid yourself of the curse. From what I understand, there are hundreds of hours of gameplay in this, and you can stop at any time. Like You can basically save the game and come back and play it later. There are a lot of people claiming this is the best card based uh solo game out there on the market no experience with it didn't back the kickstarter not willing to pay secondary market prices so i couldn't tell you from my experience but based on the experts this one seems good well, for 350 dollars, you too can learn whether or not yeah. this game is worth it uh yeah. it's, it's not anywhere near as heavy a game as uh, as the crypto uh game um but uh yeah it's up you know up to a thousand minutes of playtime. So thousand, yeah. That's it's uh it's supposed to be good. It's it's supposed to keep you busy for a long time, right? That's that's a good thing. And and you know what? It looks uh the production quality on it is top yeah. notch. So I think uh the prices that people are paying for this, uh there, there might be some reason for it. Uh hopefully it'll get a, another printing. It's had two printings yes. already. So hopefully mm-hmm. we can get a uh third out of it and maybe you'll get your chance at a reasonable price to uh get your hands on it. Yeah, like I said, based on how popular it is, I wouldn't be surprised to be reprinted. And please, people, no game is worth 300 and some dollars, in my opinion. Like, if it's a big, like, okay, Rising Sun has enough miniatures in it, this is a card game. Like, Rising Sun, the MSRP is $300. Don't pay 30 times the MSRP for a game. Just find someone that has it, go to a con and play it, or just play other games. 3,500 different games came out last year. You're not going to, your fear of missing out isn't that strong. Find something else to play. Like some fantasy games. So the other thing I saw a ton of in uh, solo player fantasy games. So like fantasies, dragons, knights, dwarves, elves, that kind of thing. Wizards, warriors. Um, One of the big ones is from Fantasy Flight Games. I first saw this game when I was in London at a store called The Game Chamber. I was like, oh, Fantasy Flight put out a new RPG. It's fantasy. And then I looked at it, and I'm like, no, it's a board game. And then I looked at it again. I'm like, no, it's so dark. I don't know what this is. Well, it ends up, it's pretty much a which way book. Like, you make characters, and I guess character generation is pretty in-depth, like almost RPG level, and then play through a series of adventures. And from what I can tell, it's most similar to the old fighting fantasy novels you could get, where you would make dice rolls now and then to figure out the outcomes. But the whole thing is just one giant which way book. And to me, this is just silly to play multiplayer because the mechanic for playing more than one player is you get to a decision point and everyone votes. Do we do A or B or A, B or C? Like, that's not a game. That's and I guess there's a rule for who you pass the book to next to read. Like, no, that's not a multiplayer game. That's a solo game. And based on reviews, it's. People, it, it's a solo game. Like, don't even bother inviting your friends over. Just finish it and then lend it to them, and they can play through it. And then you can compare stories on what happened to you and what happened to them. Yeah, no, this is this is a light game, uh, but it's got a ton of playtime uh, behind it. And uh, again, it looks beautiful, and it's available at reasonable prices. Yeah, this one sometimes goes on sale too, so watch for that because uh, Fantasy Flight falls under the MAP, the Minimum Advertised Price Policy from Asmodee. So normally you can't find it more than 20% off. So if you do see it for more than that, it's it's worth checking out. So we already mentioned that not all solo games are light family games and we've had some heavier ones. Well, this is even heavier than those. This is a game called Mage Knight. It's put out by WizKids. Yes, the people who do the hero clicks, though they do lots more now. Now, this is not the old miniature game that you bought random packs and minis on hero clicks bases and basically played Warhammer with cheap 
pre-painted plastic. This is a long, deep, heavy Euro game. It's an exploration game where you start off on one tile with multiple hexes on it. You put random dungeons out on it. You explore outward. You find towns. You find mages' towers. You find dungeons. You find caves. You find wandering monsters. It's all uh, it's the term procedurally generated with a board game, but randomly generated. Randomly generated stuff happens. You play some kind of scenario. Like one of the scenarios may be find three towns. Another scenario may be topple three towers or whatever. There's a bunch that come in the base game and it's uses a deck building mechanic. There's rules for for night and day it's it's big it's heavy and it's very long player turns like you're taking seven actions before the other player gets to go and because of that a lot of people are finding it better solo now i played this two player uh it's an excellent game but the learning curve is steep like really steep like there is i think it's a 32 page intro scenario that you're told to play through just to try to learn the different mechanics of the game and even then it doesn't explain everything and it's long like this is a game you set up and you leave set up for weeks and you come back down take a couple turns and you go do something else and you come home from work take a couple turns now again i haven't tried solo but i could see how it could be better solo because there really isn't a lot of player interaction it's mostly watch what someone else is doing on their turn and sit back and then they watch while you're doing what you do so there's no reason not to play this solo yeah, you're looking at uh, I think a a an hour to four hours the the expected gameplay. Um, yeah. And interestingly, uh, they they call this uh, reimplemented as uh, Star Trek Frontiers. That's correct. They did put out a Star Trek system version of it, but the Star Trek system they simplified greatly. I think you can play it in about half the time. They took out the whole day night cycle. They took out some of the crystal mechanics. It sounds like they really watered it down. And I don't know if that's a good thing because like I noted I've noted before where I don't like it when they make games overcomplicated, but then when you have a game that what makes it good is the fact it's that detailed and the fact that there's so many different things you can do. Like there's different rules when you discover a tower than when you discover a mage then when you discover a dungeon by taking some of that out it loses some of the the verisimilitude right like the, the the experience the the depth of it now i have not tried the new star trek game maybe it's fantastic well and, you know, and it's interesting because star trek games historically have been deep complex games so to think they would dumb down a game to turn it into a star trek uh seems odd and and not really respecting of the 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 normal <laughs> expected fan of a Star Trek game, but yeah, maybe, well, it's maybe definitely it's true going. Much. It's definitely true going back to like the eighties and nineties Star Trek games, but there's been some lighter ones that came out, like Star Trek Catan. There's uh, Star Trek Fleet Captains. There's there are there they've been trying all kinds of stuff with the license. To be honest, it, here's a totally different topic: best Star Trek games. Maybe we should cover that one time. But I'll mention it now: Star Trek Ascendancy would be the best. It's a three to five player game. Right. So up next, we're talking fantasy. There is, of course, the the uh, the big bear in the room, the big box in the room, the thirty two pound Gloomhaven. Uh, as you guys know, you've been hearing about my experiencing with this dungeon crawler uh, almost every week. Not this week because we didn't get to play last week, and we're not getting to play this week. But we've been talking about it a lot. Um, again, I haven't played solo. Um, I've only played four players and you've heard about my experiences playing four players and why that's sometimes a problem. Uh, similar to Mage Knight, many people are saying it's excellent single player. Now, the really neat thing that I'm tempted to try, and again, I mentioned this last episode about Gloomhaven. I don't see anyone really talking about this, but in Gloomhaven, you can form a new party at any time in town with a different group of players. Like, unlike other legacy games, you don't have to play with the same people every time. Technically, I don't even think you have to have anyone carrying over from a previous group. Like, Sean could come down, hook up with Eugene and a couple guys, if they knew how to play Gloomhaven, go through a, a scenario on our map, which would probably piss me off. But <laughs> it's, it's something you can do, right? So I'm tempted to make another party. And I think playing solo, there's a whole section of solo rules, like separate rules. Um, I think you make a, you might make a one or two character party. I'm not sure. But I'm tempted to try it because I could, like I explained last week, we didn't do well on the Windslept Highlands. And Tori and Kat can't make it over this Friday. So maybe tomorrow, tomorrow, two days from now, Friday, I go downstairs, make a new party and try it myself. I think it's really neat that this is possible. You know, we've we really have spoken a lot about Gloomhaven, but uh, I, I can't help but think it really would 
and, and should make a good one-player game because of the uh, the gamification, the, the video game style of it uh, really does sort of lend itself to that single-player concept. But I have to say, um, that is a big box and a big hunk of money <laughs> yes. to spend just to, yes. just to game on your own. Um, I don't know. It would be tough to recommend that as a as a you know just here for, just for you, but as a solo game, if you are also doing yes with it, absolutely all in. See that that's more yeah. what I was thinking. Now, to be honest, if you really dig board gaming over video games, Gloomhaven, you'd have to buy four copies to pay for that Xbox. Yeah, that's true. So now, Phil specifically uh, mentioned card games as well as board games. So there's a good reason for that. And I like Phil knows what he's talking about. He's he's not a a stranger to gaming. He just knows I have more experience than he does, especially with board games. There are a number of great co-op card games that I saw very strongly recommended for good single-player experiences. Yeah, it's interesting because... Uh, there is a huge solo game market, but you really need to be careful and take your time. Uh, yeah. I made the mistake when we were at QCC uh, one morning when uh, I got there early. I saw a, uh, a game called uh, Champion of Earth sitting on the table, and it, you know, one of those play and, and possibly win games. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. The art on it was actually quite nice. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, the world has been invaded by alien zombies and monsters, and mm-hmm. you need to just. Defend the world. And it was... It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, I know, uh, there's no real way to sugarcoat it. As wow. a solo game, despite the fact it's, it very clearly said it was you know, a solo player game, it was horrible. I cannot imagine anything other than the purest of luck. You know, the kind of luck that would have won someone that $1.6 billion in, in the States yesterday, uh, allowing you to, to have any success in it as a solo game. Um, and yet they were marketing it as such and yeah. wrongly in my opinion. So you, you really do need to, uh, take everything with a grain of salt when you're looking at games, marketing themselves to a solo player, make sure you do that research or, and listen to our show to find yes. out what actually works. Now we've mentioned it before, but board game geek is fantastic for this. There is a section on every board game page that says recommended player count, and that's done by the fans. And again, I've mentioned uh, Board Game Geek. The fans on Board Game Geek are your alpha gamers. They're people like me who live and breathe gaming, right? It's it's not for the casual user. The site's way too unfathomable for <laughs> some common users, right? I didn't mean that to sound as elitist as it did. Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. But it is not a well-designed site, and it takes – there's a learning curve to learning to use it and only people who are deep into gaming are going to want to spend that time. Hopefully that sounds a little better. Um, but yes, had, like going to board game Eve and reading the recommended player counts help a lot. I use that to determine what to buy and I use it when I'm planning tournaments because I want four player games. I'm going to try to find games that are recommended. And there seems to be a growing trend of people who design games For a set player account, and I don't know if it's the designers or the publishers, but someone is pushing them to make it so you can play with more player counts. I personally would prefer, if your game plays best with three players, release it as a three-player only game. No, there's there's no point in in trying to go for a broader market and hurting your game because of it. It's it's only going to make the uh, the game suffer in the long run. Fair enough. So going back to card games. So two of the Fantasy Flight living card games. Now, again, these are like Magic in that where you buy packs of cards. The difference is in a living card game, there's no randomness. So when a new expansion comes out, you buy the one box or the one set or whatever, however they sell them. And you get all the cards that come in the new set. And they release them on a schedule, again, like Magic, every so many months. I personally don't play any living card games. But... These came up on a lot of lists. So the two most popular is the Lord of the Rings living card game and the newer Arkham Horror the card game. Now, again, I haven't played either, but I did notice that Arkham Horror has an 8.2 on Board Game Geek. Like, that's up there. That's crazy high. So it sounds like it's the better of the two. I do notice that both of them uh, are listed as best at best with two player, though. So... That's, uh, uh, most that's of the living card games are the score. The uh, the scores are definitely up there, but uh, you know they are they are suggested as two player games. 
build a server. But at, you know, at the very least, the, the the people who control Lord of the Rings are very picky about how their name is used. Um, the the Tolkien estate uh, does it's... not give out that name to anyone. I noticed Steve D in our chat room says that Lord of the Rings is his number one game. So yeah, it definitely has, there is definitely some popularity with that game. As for how they play single player, I did note the Arkham Horror one. A lot of people said only the first three scenarios really work one player. Again, no experience, so I can't really tell you for sure, but that did seem to be the running theme. But the fact those three do play well, and yeah, I'm guessing these games probably are better with two, but you can play them solo, and they're not bad. Excellent. So, now over on the Slack channel, that's where Phil asked this question. Someone suggested the Pathfinder Adventure Card game which is a another multi four players you make your characters you improve your characters by deck building and you play through a pathfinder adventure uh for people who don't know what pathfinder is just think dungeons and dragons basically dungeons and dragons split into fourth edition and pathfinder at one point kind of each went down their separate paths but it's basically the same setting your same elves dwarves dragons and everything else and another one that's very similar is a game called shadow run crossfire again set in the rpg setting of shadow run i guess you don't need 60 d6s to play this version and i have heard both of those are very good for playing solo uh the pathfire adventure card game seems to have a lot of decks um yes it's kind of terrifying how many <laughs> decks uh, I, i'm seeing something along the lines of 24 different decks available for this game yeah from um, what i understand there's you buy a base set so, okay, I got to jump back to Pathfinder. So the Pathfinder role-playing game, the company that puts it out is called Paizo. They are famous for coming up with a distribution system for RPGs that hadn't been done before called the Adventure Path. So what happens is you would go on their site and you would subscribe to an Adventure Path. And what would happen is every X months, they would send you a module and it'd be the next one in the series. So the first one they did was called Rise of the Rune Lords. And you would get book one of Rise of the Rune Lords as a DM and you would run your group through it. And supposedly you would be getting to the end of that. And then book two of Rise of the Rune Lords would come out. And then book three, book four. And I think there's five books in every one. And that would take an entire year. And then the next year, Pathfinder would put out a new adventure path. And I don't know what they're all called. Uh, Skull and Shackles, I think, was the second one that came out with boats. I, so what they did is when they put out their card game, they did the exact same thing. So you get the Rise of the Loom Roads core set, and then you can subscribe to get more adventure packs that would show up. And again, I don't know how many, but say there are five of them throughout the year. And then the next year, they put out another big core box. From what I understand, they're not, you can't mix and match them. So oh, okay. you buy the Rise of the Rune Lords one, and then if you like it, you continue to buy the rest of the Rise of the Rune Lords, Rune Lords ones. You finish the story, you retire your characters, and then you move on to Skull and Shackles. So there's, now, four, I know... so there's four sets of six rather than 24 different... Exactly, okay. exactly. It's actually sense. a really brilliant way to sell modules, I thought. Uh, compared to the D and D, where you just show up and there's all these different modules, and you got to find the one that says D one, and then the next one you find is D four, and you're like, do I need D two and three in between? And they're only loosely connected. Like Paizo writes good modules; they're the people who ran Dragon Magazine for years. But now we're getting into more RPG here history, so we'll drop the rest of that. Um, so there is the Pathfinder Adventure card game. I would just look for the most recent core set. I don't know what that is offhand. Again, it's not a game I played. I believe Mummy's Mask is uh, appears to be the newest one. Uh, okay. And then as far as Shadowrun goes, uh, that one's probably uh, going to be a real binary reaction. People either love or hate Shadowrun. Um, yeah. Elves and, elves and Cyberpunk, I, I guess. You know, hey, something for everybody. Hey, I'll, I'll admit, back in the day, I was one of those Cyberpunk purists, and I didn't want dragons running corporations, and I thought it was stupid. But you know what? I, there are lots of RPGs out there with lots of interesting settings, and it's not a system I have played for more than five minutes. Yes, I played a five-minute game of Shadowrun at Origins. Um, not my bit mega tea, but hey, I, it's interesting enough. Maybe it'll come up on tomorrow's interview. I know Phil's a big uh, Cyberpunk fan, so... It is. I'll be interested to see his take on uh, on elves and cyberpunk. <laughs> I know there's no elves in uh, Rocker Boys and vending machines. 
So one last card game. So this one I played. I own it. It's it's an interesting game. It's the Dresden Files cooperative card game. This game is a puzzle. You lay out cards based on the book, the story you're trying to play, and of course there's a different set of cards for each of the Jim Butcher novels. Um, it uses a card-based system combined with elements of the Fate Core role-playing game, which is pretty cool. comes with a set of Fate dice, even. That's how I got my Fate dice I brought to QCC. Uh, it's a very neat game, and I do recommend it for fans of the Dresdenverse. And there are a lot of Dresdenverse fans out there. So That is true. I, now, I will admit, if you're not a fan of the Dresden verse, it's a very mechanical puzzle. It's playing the right cards at the right time and managing your resources. It's cool. But if you like Dresden, you'll get what the cards represent. And you'll get more into it. It's it's neat. All right. So these last few games don't really fit. As I said, I seem to find groupings of games. These ones don't group. These are kind of all over the place. Uh, but these all, again, came up multiple times, like not just once, that multiple people recommended these as uh, excellent single-player experiences. So a game we talk about a lot on this show is Terraforming Mars. Now, I really should try this solo. Like, with how much I enjoy the game and how many times I've enjoyed it at multiple player counts. I always say it's great at all player counts. Well, to be honest, I still haven't tried it at one player. I probably I, I probably should try it. I can't see it being that bad. I don't know. I'm, I'm just betting that you have so many great feelings about Terraforming <laughs> Mars that you can't bear the thought of it being bad, and so you're just skipping it. Because you know it works yeah, maybe so that's it. more. Maybe that's it. I, I should do it at some point. Uh, Scythe. Scythe is hot. Everyone is talking about size still. It's been out for more than a year, and people are still talking about it. Uh, now, it's not ranked as high as Gloomhaven, but it's up there. I think it's top five. Uh, some of the buzz is that it's great solo. You know what? I, I took a look at this one, and uh, they actually have their own rule book for solo that was actually designed mm -hmm. by a different design team and production staff. So rather than you know trying to make their game work, they actually went to the trouble of essentially building a second game yeah. into it specifically for the solo play. Uh, and, you know, excellent. I, they didn't try and, and you know, go shoehorn and just say, it. hey, we can do it. No, no, no. They they went, no, no, we can't shoehorn this. Let's do it right. Um, no, it's excellent. Great to hear. So Russian Railroads, this is one of my all-time favorite engine building games. I love the way that the scoring scales up as you progress. Like you start off scoring six points on the first turn, and the last turn you're going to score 680 points. Very neat game. I really dig it. Before doing this research, though, I had no clue you could play it solo. But supposedly it's really good. Well, I mean, we've talked about this before. This was your number one suggestion when it came to uh, that... Uh... That form of mechanics in our in our episode yes. about mechanics, so uh, it'll be interesting to hear if you uh, do get a chance to play it solo and uh, report back. Now this is the last game, last one. This came up time and time again when I researched top solo games, and on almost everyone's best one player game list is the long out of print Gates of Loyang. So as we mentioned before. I like to talk about some older games. I do have a copy of this game. I've had it for years. Uh, you're going to have a real hard time finding this without paying a stupid amount of money. Uh, about 100 and, 150 bucks minimum? Yeah, it's not worth that much. Well, unless you really like playing your solo games. You pair it with Gloomhaven. Maybe now you sell your Xbox. You can buy both. I don't know. So for this article, this topic, this uh, talk, I used a variety of sources to dig up some of these games. Uh, if you head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on gaming advice, you'll find the blog version of this post. Uh, it's titled Playing by Yourself, Solo Tabletop Gaming. Now, besides having a bit more detail about each game we talked about tonight, I also list some of my primary sources I use to get this information. So... Uh... This was a great talk, but if you'd like to read up more on this topic, be sure to check in the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in blog form. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions, sorry, at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, reminder, Patreon patrons like Phil at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout-out and a thank-you to our backers, Misdirected Mark, 
a thanks and a shout out to our brother podcast. Join Chris, Phil, yep, that Phil again, and Bob <laughs> as they talk about game gaming and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thanks again for the hookup at The Secret Seller. I'm looking forward to hearing our ad on their podcast. Duran Barnett, thanks for your support, boosting our signal on social media. Joe Swick, so when do we get our own beer? Like your Mike Doc, we stout. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitter at 30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live. Take your podcatchers Tuesday morning at 2 a.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. Game on.